Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this session. Uh, my name is Tim Dyke. I'm an EMCC Global Accreditation Manager, and I also have the pleasure of working with our speaker, Vanessa Fudge, who is a um, master practitioner, EMCC master practitioner, um, and um, works in the systemic leadership area. So over to you, Vanessa. Thank you so much, Tim, and welcome everyone. Uh, this is going to be a quite an interactive session. So I can see some of you haven't got your videos on. If you can, if you can put your videos on in the next few minutes, then um, then we'll be good to go. It's the design of the session is quite uh, interpersonally connected. So it will be very strange for you to participate as a black box. Now, if you Welcome, Lewis. It's great to see your face. Welcome, Eileen. If you can't participate fully, in other words, if you've got something else that you're doing right now and you can't be fully here, I'm going to suggest that you access the recording later um, so the session can proceed as planned for those that have been able to attend fully in person with their videos on. Welcome, Ranjit. Nice to meet you. Uh, Carolina, Damien, Linnea, Owen, Cassie, welcome. It's great to see you, Damien. It's great to see you. Welcome. Big welcome to you. So that just leaves Linnea, Owen, uh, Carolina, who I think is, is our technical host. You watch the recording. Oh, I'm so sorry. You're not well today, Owen. Um, it, it, there will be recorded materials available. I'm so sorry you're not well. So Owen's had to leave. Uh, Luba, Linnea, Carolina, if you can just let us know if you're able to stay and participate fully, that will be really wonderful. I'll come back to this in just a moment. But before I begin, I would like to just pause to acknowledge the traditional First Nations people of the various lands that we're meeting from this evening, this morning, this afternoon, depending on which time zone you're in right now. I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I'm hosting today from the Camaragal lands of the Eora Nation and I'd like to especially give pause and reflect on how ancient Indigenous wisdom would have us view conflict and for what yield, because there's so much we can learn from them. So I'll just, I'll come back to the room and I'll just see who we've got. Uh, Matt, welcome. It's great to see you. Thank you. And um, see, we've got Linnea just connecting to audio. I mentioned before that it's a video on session. And I know somebody had to leave because I think they were just going to have my voice playing in the background. That would normally be fine, except for um, not this session, because for the participants to look at a topic like conflict, it is consciously and subconsciously very meaningful to us. And I'm wanting to allow both layers of processing into our time together today and that means you being available fully for this session. I mean, I do it too. I, I think, oh, I'll go along to that. But I'm, then I have my boys arriving home and I'm trying to, you know, hop in the car or whatever it is I'm doing. It's, that might be fine for an information exchange, but not very helpful for you as participants on this particular session. So I'll just check with the Emma, Carolina, uh, Linnea, and just see whether you can stay fully or whether you need to catch the recording later so we can we can dive in properly. Uh, Linnea, am I pronouncing your name correctly? You look like you're in San Francisco there near the beautiful Golden Gate Bridge. Yes, 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 you got it. And I'm just driving at the moment, but I'll be home soon. So I'm with you. Okay, great. All right. And when you, you'll be able to have video on. Um, okay, great. All right. So um, so a little bit about this session. I've probably made it um, enormously clear that it's quite interactive. I'd like to um, encourage you to, to engage in some reflective practice, but only the amount of that that's sound and appropriate for you today. 
I'm not here to push anyone into an experience that you're not ready to have. I'm encouraging you to take what you've come to receive, no more, no less. And, and if, you, if you really find you want to, if I put you into breakout, for example, and you find, oh, I don't want to be the coachee, that's fine. I, I want you to do what's right and sound for you. I also like to say, because um, I'm meeting most of you for the first time, I'm assuming you're meeting each other, at least most of you for the first time. And we might be sharing some reflective experiences and perhaps even stories about our coaching and mentoring experience with conflict. And so to make that a sound process, I would request that we keep any information we learn about each other as confidential from this call. That's confidential about each other. That's confidential about any organisations that you might choose to name. I won't ask you to name any organisations, uh, but should you name them, should that information slip out, I would request that that's completely contained as confidential. And if we can all just do a show of hands so you can look around the room and we can agree and abide by that, that would be really, really helpful. The thing with Zoom, Cassie and Damien, is you might have your hand up and we actually can't tell, so you might need to put it like right up next to your face so um, so we can, we can see. Cassie, are you able to do that too? Yes, you're happy with that? Good. All right. And you can all, you can all, you've all taken that in. Let's, in that case, uh, go exploring, shall we, about this fascinating field of work, uh, conflict, and what it can mean to us as coaches when we are brought in to work with conflict. And especially um, what gets asked of us is to resolve it and what that might entail. So, we're going to be exploring four topics in the next two hours. Ranjit, you have a question. I oh, know you just, or is that just put your hand up from before? Apologies. Yeah, I forgot it. It's from that. before. Yes. Already, <laughs> I won't make a habit of pouncing on anyone like that unless they truly think you have um, something you need to say. So, sorry, Ranjit. This, um, the four topics, we're going to look at the seductive nature of conflict work and, um, and, and how can we get seduced in this type of work. We're going to look at conflict through a systemic lens and then we're going to explore my relationship with conflict and how can I evolve my relationship with conflict so I can grow into this work and not feel in any way um, that it makes me any, any, any smaller. Than I, than I need to be in relation to conflict, but that I can expand my learning, my awareness and my capability to work with conflict. So we're going to start with the seduction of conflict and, and have a look at how we can get roped into conflict work in the first place. And I thought I'd just start initially with a question. And if you're approached by a client, maybe a client rings you and says, we need some help with some conflict we're having. I wanted to ask you what comes up for you. And perhaps if you can put that into the chat and I'll get a bit of a sense for that. What's the first thing that comes up for you when, when you get given an assignment and you're told it, it involves conflict? So Matt's saying, I want to know more. Fantastic. Tell me more. Lois, curious, Ranjit, any other responses? Um, I get excited about the prospects of a breakthrough. Curiosity, maybe run away, Damien. Yeah, you can have a dual, at least two reactions. Um, anticipation, Eileen. So that's wonderful to understand your various responses and this thread of curiosity is possibly, uh, if, if I was just to share one empowering lens, it would just be that, it would be curiosity for all that I don't know about any conflict situation. That is a supremely powerful lens. I'm sure you don't need me to tell you how powerful it is to stay curious and not jump to conclusions. I certainly want to acknowledge that I want to know more, that curiosity, tell me more. That's, that's really fantastic because 
inevitably in a conflict situation, it's going to carry its own surprises. And just when I think I've understood it, it's likely to throw me a curveball and have another layer of complexity to the situation. Because we're looking at conflict in organisations and they carry so much story uh, that there's, no matter how long I've worked with an organisation, there's so much of its story that I have yet to know and contact and understand. And I also appreciate that maybe runaway sensation that comes up as well. I, I have that too. I've reflected on, you know, on, on where this has come for me. And I can only say it's, it's a dynamic thing working with conflict. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. My observation, I have a team of amazing coaches around the country. Um, Leading Well is our organisation. So because we have leadership and well-being in our fo focus, I realised a bit late, we were always going to attract conflict work <laughs> because um, people often reach for that well-being support when they're feeling most challenged. And what I notice about myself, my team, in various degrees is as coaches, we can be quite peace-loving beings. <laughs> I don't know if you find that you're that way as well. I know, um, I know I, I really like, I like peacemaking. <laughs> I like to resolve conflict and I feel good if I can create this land of peace where I can happily dwell. And while that seems like a magnificently altruistic intention to carry into conflict work, it can also lead to disappointment for the client, for myself because conflict wants to tell its own story. And it's not always a peaceful story. Um, conflict is sometimes here to shock us into a state of being awake when before we might have been asleep to what wants to be expressed through the system of a client organisation. So before we unpack this any further, I'd love you to reflect on what are some of the seductions in working with conflict. And once again, actually let's, I'm wondering, it might be a good time to go to a breakout so I can support you to work with each other. I'll stop sharing. And how about we go, we go to those breakouts. I'm just gonna double check. Madiha, can you hear me? Because I, I don't want to put a blank, a blank screen into a breakout. Um, and Luba as well. I need to just check that you're both available for breakouts. I'm going to repeat the question for you. What are some of the seductions in working with conflict? Do you know what I mean by that word seduction? Does anyone want to want me to pause and unpack that any further or is it completely clear? Getting nods. Tell us more. <clears throat> Tell us more, Matt. Okay. Uh, thank you, Luba. That would be good if you can be in a bit with the video on. So... A seduction is when I get drawn in, not realising what I'm being drawn into. It's like being a little bit like the dust in the vacuum cleaner. I'm in. <laughs> I've been, there's, a, there's quite a pull to um, enter a dynamic between people or within an organisation. Uh, conflict can be at, in, at a cultural level as well. It can actually be... Um, countries expressing themselves even within an organisation. So the seduction is what I would look back on later and realise I had no clue about, but I was compelled to say yes. I was compelled to be there. Irresistible. A seduction is irresistible pull to do, to be involved, to connect, to lend my energy. Is that a little bit clearer? So the question is, and I'll let you explore this in the breakouts, what are some of the seductions in working with conflict? See which ones you can pull out. Maybe you've experienced some of these already. Maybe you're anticipating them. Maybe you've learnt a great deal from them already, which is why I think it's so good to go to a breakout at this point. And let's, let's uh, allow in pairs, let's allow six minutes. So there's a good few minutes each to reflect on what you realise are some seductions in working with conflict professionally as a mentor, a coach, a facilitator.
Welcome back, everyone. Uh, it would be great to hear about some of those seductions that you named in your breakouts. Would anybody like, and you can just wave at me. We're a lovely small group, so it's easy for me to respond to you just waving your hand. Would anybody like to share some of the seductions that popped up in your discussions? <laughs> um, yeah, I think that, you know, the, um, the opportunity to be peacemaker and bring harmony and, uh, that's pretty exciting. And, and uh, I think for me, there's another element of uh, problem solving. Like what is the, what's underlying this? And I love to solve a problem and crack a nut open and like figure out what's going on here. Um, yeah. But I think that, you know, that I, I was telling Louis, even going back to high school, I can remember myself, you know, wanting to be the peacemaker between warring tribes. Like how can I solve this and bridge this gap and come out of it smelling like roses? Yes. Yes. Beautiful seductions. Magnificent. Uh, anybody else? Any, 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 anything else pop up? Eileen, you were with uh, Luba. Yeah, um, I'll just share mine and if Luba would like to share hers. But for me, um, what I was saying is that I deliberately um, a few years back joined um, the official visitors to prison so that I would learn not to be judgmental and mm -hmm. to be curious obviously yeah. but and uh, but now you know I've been coaching for a number of years and I have to be mindful of not jumping into problem solving me mm -hmm. I don't provide a solution and learned it a while ago but it's just sitting back and that's why I like the word anticipation because you're waiting to see what's coming and what truly is the conflict. And is there a conflict? And where does that conflict sit? Is it with the person in their head? Is it the other person? We can't fix the other person. So there's a lot going on. So it's anticipation of what's coming out and to help them um, explore that. Yes. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Eileen. That official visit at a prison program sounds amazing and wonderful to explore in conflict my relationship with the perpetrator energy as well as, um, you know, my relationship to the peacemaker energy and am I able to be present for all energies that can arise in conflict work. Thank you for sharing. And did you want to add anything from that conversation, Luba, yourself? Uh, sure. I shared my experience um, working with culturally diverse teams and that I sometimes, as a, as a team coach, sometimes choose to step back and not um, address the conflict, especially if, it's a, if I sense a hidden conflict, when I'm not sure how um conflict what, how conflict is addressed in some of the cultures present in the room or um, you know whether it would be culturally appropriate to talk to to raise that conflict at that stage of our engagement maybe especially if we are at an earlier stages of uh, team engagement so i know that i'm being extra mindful of addressing mm -hmm. conflict with culturally diverse teams and groups Yes, yes. Um, it's been noted by lots of practitioners that sometimes with that, with that cultural diversity, there, there is actually country level conflict playing out in personal relationships and couples therapists have noticed this as well. Um, I once, I once had a client and when she reflected on some conflict, it was linking right back to the Serbian army, um, the anger that she was feeling and a loss of property in her family system. Uh, so it is fascinating, the subconscious drivers of conflict and how deep they can go. Uh, and yeah, how wonderful Luba to take a really sensitive approach when working with culturally diverse teams, because um, when, it, when it is large societal conflict, it does have an extraordinarily high charge connected to it. And it does need quite some careful holding. Thank you so much for sharing. Anybody else like to share uh, from the other breakout rooms, other seductions that we haven't named yet that can pull you in with conflict work or blindside you? Yes, Cassie. 
Hi, uh, I Hi. was in the same room with the Ranjit, and, and I shared some uh, uh, seduction to conflict I experienced. Could I? I uh, I'm specialized in coaching working moms, and uh, and then the working moms normally have some struggling in the workplace, especially when the uh, employer probably uh, have some uh, like bias the treatment to the working moms, and then uh, they probably struggle with the the. the family and work balance and then I found it is very easy for me to uh, to be personally involved and emotionally because I'm a working mom myself and then uh, uh, I, I could get into that uh, okay how to solve this problem uh, mode <laughs> if it re resonates my own uh, issue uh, my own experience in the past so I found that this is a uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm very easy to fall into that uh, that uh, pit yeah <laughs> And thank you, Cassie, for naming that because um, that is a, a core product. A core seduction is my conflict is playing out in my client space, and I am completely seduced because I'm actually trying to resolve my conflict through their conflict. And of course, that's only human, and that's not bad. I don't want anyone to hear that. Well, that's bad, and I should step away. No. It's sometimes inevitable, as a matter of fact. And if I can work with it consciously rather than unconsciously, then, um, then it can be held and it doesn't need to in any way disservice my client. In fact, it might be of greater service to them because now I have another level of compassion for what it is that they're experiencing and deep awareness and understanding of what that lived experience feels like and what a resolution would hold as a really powerful, good outcome for them. But it all comes with acknowledging, ah, I'm in my movie as well as their movie right now as we're having this conversation, and I must not get hypnotised by mine as I'm listening to theirs. So thank you so much for naming that. And Ranjit, you were there with Cassie. Is there anything you wanted to add to this um, seduction? Yeah, I think uh, I was just, uh, you know, appreciating her vulnerability and sharing it. And I think what emerged for me was much as what you'd shared, that we sometimes think, think that being seduced is always um, on the negative polarity. I think you being having gone through um, and can identify with it um, in many ways, as you mentioned, being conscious, there's also a lot of stuff that can be helpful to the client as well. Um, so yeah. I think there's that other polarity as well. And at which source are you holding that? Yes. So you're saying, Ranjit, that uh, seduction can be a positive thing. We mustn't hold it as strictly a negative thing. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. yeah. And which source am I holding? Yes. You might argue that um, that my, all coaching work is a seduction or all mentoring work is a seduction. Because when I look back with hindsight, I might ask myself if I really knew how would I have entered the relationship? How would I have entered the situation? I was seduced to enter it this way, but what it, with the magnificent hindsight reflection, it, I might have learnt from the seduction to approach it differently next time as well. Yes, thank you. That's such a good point and wow. Don't get me started on polarities. That's such a that is such a rich domain of exploration. Uh, I'll see if we can weave a little bit more in on that now that it's come into the room. It's clearly here. I better not be seduced into avoiding it because that would just be a reverse seduction. I'm not going there. <laughs> then I could fool myself quite happily. Uh, and there's one more breakout room. I'm wondering if Damien or uh, Muhammad or Madiha, if any, if either of any of the three of you would like to share anything else that came up in relation to seduction, if you can just wave, because there's three of you. Anything you wanted to add? Um, we, ha we haven't, well, we've, yes, Damien. So bri briefly, what we're saying is that coaches, we are not working to fix problems. So ideally, like we want to work on development of leaders and our clients. So when there is conflict, we have to be careful because many times, for example, in organizations, we are called to work with a person and there is conflict with this person. So it can be a way that the company is manipulating the coaching process to get rid of a person, for example, in the organization. Yeah. So we need to be listening a lot, paying a lot of attention 
to uh, in, in in contracting really to figure out to find out what the client needs what the organization needs uh, in my experience for many years many times the person who needs the coaching is not the client or the organization call us to work with the client but the person who needs the coaching is the boss so we need to uh, pay a lot of attention and be very curious and uh, and I think that conflict is not good nor bad um, but we have to um, be very curious about what's really going on and not, not don't jump into conclusions or into my experience as a supervisor also supervising coaches in many times coaches jump into relationship with clients when the clients are not ready for coaching and that sometimes yeah. can create conflict also between the coach and the client so true. Thank say, you. But that's okay. that's that's so helpful, Damien. Thank you so much. And you've gone to what, what I'm what I attempted to describe as the ultimate seduction in not just conflict, but coaching, you could say, and it's and mentoring too. It's to fix. Am I am I coming in to fix? And what if it doesn't want to be fixed? And I want the fix, but this situation does not want to be fixed. And so it's um, very seductive if I feel, and, and I, I would love to claim I've never gone into fix, <laughs> but I know when I reflect on all my years of coaching that that can be a recurring theme seduction. And I don't even, I have to really look out for this one to fix, to want to fix, because uh, we like to problem solve. And yet to fix another person or to fix a relationship makes me extraordinarily big all of a sudden, like I'm going to morph over it all with some kind of supreme magical power. And it might not be anything there to be fixed at all. It might be something very different that wants to happen. Um, and who am I to fix anyone? <laughs> I can't claim to not need any fixing myself. So who am I to go around fixing other people? Thank you so much. Um, Thank you so much for sharing. I think you're already well aware of so many seductions. I'm going to colour in the picture a little bit more, uh, building on what you've already shared there. And I really, I, I, I love to work with my peer coaches as well when it comes to conflict because I really appreciate another perspective on this because it can simply be so rich and multi-layered. So I think this is this has come up already simply to say that conflict has a magnificence about it and it's simply that whatever is unresolved in my own story is likely to feature in any in my coaching assignments with conflict and we've already spoken about this um it was Cassie talking about working with working mums, coaching working mums as a working mum. Of course, that's a that's a really, really beautiful and clear example. And there'll be many more subtle examples. I'm quite likely to meet my own unresolved relationship in the nemesis of a client. And before I know it, I could be siding with them in the conflict. But that's not our role, is it, as coaches uh, to, to side with, to fix or to rescue. So the challenge is to remain neutral and open to all perspectives without missing my own story playing out through the process. And of course, as soon as I've judged, I've lost my ability to perceive. So in deciding that one is wrong and one is right, all of a sudden I'm, I'm shut into a narrow paradigm and I'm not as resourced to notice and perceive and explore in the same way. Uh, and so we're going to be talking soon about a system lens for this. And to seed that awareness, it's good to realize that systems like to recruit us too, not just individuals, but the organization as a, as a human living, dynamic, evolving system. And we can easily get through these seductions, get recruited when the system's need for completeness collides with our own blind spot. And then bang, we're in, but we're not necessarily consciously in. And so if we're not really careful and using great resourcing like supervision is a really good one as our peers uh, inside an organisation, we can become entangled help, helpers. 
and it's challenging for us to be useful then without a cost. And we can avoid this, and you've already said it at the very start when you mentioned curiosity, uh, to be on the lookout for any of my own unresolved past that could be playing through the movie of my client's story. Ranjit, did you want to say anything? You've got your hand up there. Yeah. Thanks, Vanessa. I was just offering an example um, mm -hmm. uh, just to bring that a little bit more related to the system's need for completeness and one's blind spot. Yeah. Oh, uh, would you? you uh, yeah, just an example would be helpful. An example for me. Yes. Yeah. 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 Interestingly, this morning I was with a group of five directors. The CEO is also the founder and he's he's leaving this week after 19 years of running this business. And we did a we did it what's called a timeline exercise where we set up a timeline in the room and he put down pieces of paper on the floor with all the vital formative events that have happened in in that organization. And then the other directors did, you know, I joined here and these were my key events, et cetera. And there were numerous events. And when he stood on them as pieces of paper on the floor, he said, I haven't told you this. I didn't tell you, you know, that back in 1983, we nearly liquidated. And the only reason we continued was this. So it's not uncommon that elements of an organisational narrative get omitted and deleted over time. And so what can happen when there are deletions and omissions? We get like the obvious dynamics and the obvious system, but we also get a hidden version of that. Now that can create strange dynamics that result in conflicts. And we'll be speaking to that more throughout this session. We have another client, which is a government department, and they have buried parts of their history, which is their treatment of the Australian Indigenous when they first established as a government department and certain atrocities that they committed back then. They're only coming to light now. But I can say coaching in that system, there's always been inexplicably high levels of conflict that is that are quite charged. And I'm incredibly curious as this narrative comes to the light of day what might shift in the dynamics there I can't say for sure but I'm curious about why there are so many difficult dynamics in that place and whether there's any link between its hidden history and what plays out across that system in inexplicable ways does that start to answer the question thanks thanks Vanessa I'll speak a little bit more to this um very soon, actually. I'm really glad that you've asked that question. And I can't see everyone's hands all the time as I move between presentation modes, so do feel free to speak up. We're a really small group. So let's now have a look at exactly Ranjit's question and coming to this, looking at it through the systemic lens. And before we do that, because I've given you a couple of examples that I'm working on at the moment, but it would be great to have your own active reflection here happening at the same time. It might not be a current assignment, might not, um, might not even be uh, from your work. It's fine as well if it's more a personal dynamic, but can you reflect on a situation if it's or a coaching assignment or facilitation assignment involving conflict where you felt stretched. Now, I'm not going to ask you to name that right now, but I'm planting the seed so you have your own reflection. Maybe you can just take a, take a minute and see if there's one that comes up for you. A situation involving conflict where you have felt stretched, ideally in an organisation because that's the context of this workshop today, ideally in an organisation, just one where you have felt stretched. Maybe just when you've got one, just wave at me so I know that you've got something that you can actively reflect on through the session. You do, Cassie. You do, Eileen. Matt, have you got one that you can reflect on? I'll give you some time to dig one up. Too many. Too many. Ah, well, then the first one that comes to mind, 
whichever one is 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 presencing itself for you right now is the one to focus on it will make itself known it will find you i'm actually quite new to coaching so i'm just learning oh, okay, yeah. things yeah okay that's fine you can just yeah. um you might you might just like to listen in and see yeah. see what see what arises through this all right so ho- hopefully those that you have one available that you can ref- you can refer back to you've you've got that there for yourself now as we okay. walk into this sure so what what i'm sure many of you already know and that we're going to be exploring now is the fact that conflicts conflict is not always personal even if it feels intensely personal it doesn't necessarily mean that it is personal so just to share a little bit of my early history conflict found me uh, i was managing a leadership program in the sports industry in australia at the government sports industry holding a lot of olympic sports in this org- sporting organization and a colleague of mine was running a session and there was a conflict that arose in that session that led to a government investigation we have a governing body called um, icac here in australia and someone complained about this session to icac and so i saw my my client uh, drawn in a very lengthy investigation because a conflict had arisen i realized much much later that it wasn't personal at all this conflict it was between two parts of the organization one part didn't feel seen by the other part the part that felt seen was called high performance i guess you are going to get seen if you have a name like high performance people are going to be quite most likely seduced by your high performance and and want to notice you and look at you and the part that didn't feel seen and supported was uh corporate services so this is this is the back office domain finance logistics operations and corporate services were accusing high performance of um quite significant conflicts of interest which the thorough investigation unearthed nothing of any substance but it's just that if you were working for corporate services you didn't particularly like high performance and it was much bigger than the individuals it was literally in the system not in the individuals and i saw quite a lot of enormous personal stress and strain go on my clients through this process as they were accused of things that they hadn't even entertained the thought of doing and so it made me realize this is probably about 10 years ago that there was a lot to learn about conflict and it's what set me on the road to becoming a systemic leadership coach because i vowed to myself that i would learn to understand where the conflict lived and not try and solve it at the level that didn't exist because i saw the personal cost of that through this process and and so we know don't we when we go in as coaches we only ever want to strengthen our clients and we never want to weaken them and i learned through that process that both the possibilities that need careful managing with complex pieces of organizational work and so um long story short i ended up going from australia to the uk about nine times learning all about systemic practice and so some of that i'm sharing with you today and i'm sharing it with you what's been really useful with clients since going and doing that piece of learning so the trick here is even though it feels personal doesn't mean it is the sensation of the conflict really has nothing to do with the source of the conflict and so one of the first things to notice with conflict and one of the reasons why not all of the reasons why but one of the reasons why it can be so emotionally charged is when we're in a state of conflict in an organization it can impact our sense of belonging our sense of belonging is something that's hardwired from birth when you reflect on us as a human species we are extraordinarily dependent on our family system our belonging system at an early age we're not like horses or cows we're not running around the paddock the afternoon we're born for a good solid 18 months much longer than that 
our survival is dependent on our ability to belong to others. And so we carry some of that hard wiring, some of that deep fight, flight, freeze response into organisations as well because the brain doesn't distinguish between those systems. It's a hardwired response. Fascinatingly, senior leaders are often numb to it by the time they've worked their way up into those roles. But the more junior members of an organisation are very, very strongly drawn into the need to orient their behaviour towards acceptable forms in order to belong. And so one of the reasons why people get so incredibly tense when facing into conflict is because they sense, usually subconsciously, sometimes consciously, that it's placing their belonging under threat. And so that's why it feels so powerful quite often. Um, it's, it's a threatened sense of belonging that is neurologically interpreted as a threatened sense of existence. And so here we are, peace-loving beings as coaches, <laughs> dealing with people's threatened existence. Now, logically and rationally, they're not really threatened. They'll get another job or that person will leave or it'll move on. But that's not the experience in conflict. The experience in conflict can be this heightened charge of um, this is threatening me, this is threatening my life, my existence, even though that makes no sense. And you can't rationalise it out of them, can you? No, no matter what you say, you can go to worst case scenario and point out they'll be fine, but it's not going to necessarily switch off the fight flight response that people can easily find themselves captured in, in a conflict situation. And so it's helpful, isn't it, that we understand conflict in our own body as coaches and mentors and facilitators. And I'm going to encourage you to reflect on how you have, how you relate to this. And in your story, was there a time that you experienced conflict at work and did that impact your sense of belonging? And how did it impact your sense of belonging? And so... We just have it checking on the time here. We've got some time. Let's go to breakout rooms again and different breakout rooms this time. And let's take an, let's take another, let's say six minutes and just to share your story and whether you, whether you can identify a time that you experienced conflict and how it threatened your sense of belonging and what that was like. see welcome back welcome back um would anyone like to, would anyone like to share what came up in relation to belonging from a breakout and if i can just share vanessa what really yeah. rang home what really rang home for me was a sense of belonging and the systemic lens which you shared and um, this I'm going back to my corporate career and we were going through a merger and, um, and often it wasn't really personal, but there was a sense of belonging which side of the, of the two companies you sat. And, um, and very often then, once you take those stands, very often you're in that um, inconsequential game of who's right rather than um, what are the facts. So I think, yeah, uh, just looking back, it was more a sense of belonging to a tribe, um, which you can get sucked in, you know. And um, and you're right; it's really brought home the point around the um, systemic thing to be complete in some respects, and how you can get sucked in. So thanks. That was just my insight. It's a great example. A merger can be the corporate equivalent of forced migration. And um, we know how that goes, don't we? That's And, you know, many of our family systems already have events like that as transgenerational traumas, of course. And so the triggers in scenarios like mergers, acquisitions, I'm not saying they go dreadfully for everyone at all. It's just... Um, the leadership awareness to manage these possible triggers 
goes a long, long way for a much smoother transition if it can be worked with consciously. Uh, so yeah, that's a really, really great, very powerful example. When we break belonging, what comes up usually is a feeling of guilt. And Bert Hellinger, who was one of the fathers of family systemic work and many organisational systemic practitioners studied with Hellinger before he passed away very recently at age 96, I think it was. Um, he, he spoke about, and we'll have a look in a moment, at our sense of conscience. It's not necessarily about right and wrong. It's often much more linked to belonging and whether we feel we will be included or excluded that can govern our actions. And um, I'm the second generation. I'm a second generation um, in a family of Holocaust survivors in the Second World War. So I have some sense of this from my own family system when I reflect on what happened in the Second World War and crimes committed by the Nazis that were done in innocence. And what I mean by it is not that they were innocent, but it was the sensation of innocence that drove their behaviours because belonging for them included some of these extraordinary rules of behaviour that were considered acceptable and actually ethically superior. So belonging is powerful, isn't it? It can when we when we reflect on group think, which is a common term, to really understand group think is to understand belonging. So it's um it's a it's a good land to visit when it comes to conflict in in human systems. So what's helpful, given that not all conflict is personal, uh, what's helpful is when it's not personal, to not personally dissect individuals <laughs> and do personality-based assessments. They'll get us nowhere if the conflict is in the system, not the person. What helps is to zoom out, like our friend here. And when it comes to belonging and this sense of guilt and innocence that I was touching on, there's three fundamental layers to this complex equation that um, I'm, I'm highlighting here that I'll speak to quite briefly. So we've got our personal system, and this is our family system. It's our, if you like, our life system. And I'll just explain, I'm using the word system a lot. The best definition I like for this is the Greek origins of the word system, which just mean to stand together. Human beings are beings that are engineered to stand together. Uh, we do have the archetype of the hermit, but it's not usually a thriving perception that we get. We thrive when we're in connection. Uh, that doesn't mean I can't be an introvert. <laughs> I absolutely can. Uh, there's still some level of contact involved in being an introvert, even if it's meted out. So at the personal level, I'm just explaining how conscience works because conscience plays a big role in behaviour and thereby in conflict too because it can drive our decisions. At a personal level, this is how we, we govern our own behaviour to protect our belonging. We do this consciously. And if I go back to the example of Luva and culturally diverse teams, it's quite likely in a culturally diverse team that there could be a cultural clash of belonging rules. There could be a cultural clash of belonging rules, i.e., if I've grown up in this country, it's considered uh, acceptable and appropriate to speak like this, to act like this. Uh, let's say I've grown up in the American culture. It's considered culturally appropriate to assert my voice, hold my ground, have myself heard, express myself. If I've grown up as a woman in a completely different culture, it might be considered culturally appropriate to do the opposite. And so the organisation and Luba is so wise to go carefully with culturally diverse teams because they have very different belonging rules. And if I'm leading a team, I need to find a way of building belonging for everyone, even though it's nigh impossible to avoid clashing with some of those belonging rules. Uh, I experienced this myself quite early in my career when I worked for a large global technology organization and I was given a very exciting role it was looking after global relationships 
and I was given an allowance for a car. It was a big allowance and, you know, I, I got the car and I loved the car. It was, you know, really nice, bright, sporty, flashy car. And I, I felt so happy. I love driving in the car. It was so much fun until I had to go to a family event and I couldn't get in the car. My family doesn't believe it's wise to spend money on on um, things that depreciate like cars. There's no bling in my family at all. We're not flashy. And so I had to go to a family event. I couldn't get in the car. Suddenly, this car that felt so good in one system and secured my belonging threatened my belonging in another system. And I, I got a lift with somebody else in the family that day because to show up in this car felt so wrong, so wrong. And so you can see there at this personal layer of conscience and this feeling of right and wrong that was really all about acceptance and belonging, uh, what was right for me in one system was dreadfully wrong in another. Now, this can happen, can't it, in the one organisation. What's absolutely right for sales is completely wrong for operations. Uh, but we've got the personal overlay here as well. So up above personal is systemic. Now it starts to get very, very fascinating with conflict because the systemic conscience is how the system strives for its own completion. This is where dynamics form that we touched on earlier and Ranjit asked a question, an example, and we just we explored two examples. These are dynamics that emerge in organisational systems around excluded events and narrative. And so when we're resolving conflict at an organisational systemic level, it's often about including what's being excluded. And it's not necessarily individuals. It's often events. It could be failures. It could be people who left badly. It could be discarded products, services, values, brands, purpose, vision, could be any number of things that was not duly honoured in the story of the organisation. So the systemic conscience operates through us unconsciously. And you can think of it as the workplace system acting on us without us even knowing it. I'm going to be unpacking this, this one specifically uh, for most of the rest of this workshop. Right above that, we've got the universal conscience. This is very large movements of transformation that sweep through not just organisations and families, but societies. So COVID would have been one of these um, in terms of its impact on how we acted and what we considered okay and not okay. Uh, world wars work like this. And so when we have these universal waves of change, they bring destruction and they bring creation, all, at the, all in the one fell swoop. And so we can start to appreciate, can't we, just how complex conflict can be, particularly at times like now when we don't just have the aftermath, and some would argue we're not at all in the aftermath, and I'm still deciding for myself, of COVID, but we also have digitisation, Industry 4.0. You know, here in Australia, there's talk about a digital identity that's that's very alarming for some people and very peaceful for others. We have, um, we have talk of economies around the world going into inflation and likely recession. Uh, we have major weather events occurring. We have talk of climate change. The list goes on, doesn't it? I don't want to make everyone feel freaked out and depressed right now. But what a time to be working with conflict, hey? <laughs> We've got so many layers operating and they can all easily pull us into conflict dynamics. And so really to work with conflict, I, I find for myself, is to work very much as somebody who can learn from the conflict and somebody quite likely to miss pieces as I go along because there could be a total litany of factors at play in what's showing up as a conflict between two individuals. Just check in if this is making sense. Does anybody want to ask a question? Should we keep going? Let's keep going. I'm keen to do some more practical exploring of this um, for yourselves as well. So 
As a coach, a mentor, a facilitator, a leadership practitioner, whatever you would like to call yourself nowadays, the first question to ask is, at what level am I being asked to intervene? It's really different at a personal level to an organisational systemic level to, I mean, we know at a societal level that's quite obvious that's a very, very big different one. However, we might find ourselves in an organisational assignment experiencing societal layers of conflict as well. I'm currently coaching a white male of British origin who's in a very compelling conflict with an Indian female um, of my wonderful colleague pointed out to me, Brahmin descent. And so um, there's so many, there's so much societal cultural layers to this conflict that are playing out um, um, under the radar screen that need holding as well. Lots to learn, isn't there? Now, I'm not suggesting we all run away from conflict work in case it seems that way at the moment. I'm merely suggesting that we acknowledge the rich territory that we're there to explore and all the unknowns that we could find ourselves discovering in this process. So I'm suggesting that we go to conf into conflict as explorers. Uh, in organisations, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna focus right in there now, uh, the organisational and its conflicts. It's important to know if the conflict, first of all, first question, is the conflict in the people or the system? Big clue is, and I'm sure many of you have heard it before, when whoever's the sponsor for the coaching work tells you they get on really well socially, but they fight when they're at work. There's your light bulb. Okay, it's a really good sign then that the conflict is in the system. They get on really well outside of work, but they fight when they're at work. So they can transcend the conflict, but not at work. So the conflict is arising out of the work system. I don't want to be overly simplistic here, but I do want to just highlight some wonderful signposts. Uh, if it is in the system, it can be in various places, of course. Two obvious ones, it could be in the role or it could be in the function. I'm not going to go into orders too deeply here. Uh, and perhaps if you've got more interest in this, you can. I, I can certainly um, open more of this up to you beyond this session, and I'll talk about that at the end. So uh, let me give you a quick example of conflict in the role. Um, working with a few organisations right now that are going through a transition of CEO. In one organisation, four execs were encouraged to go for the CEO role. How are those executives going to look at the new CEO that was hired externally and that started this week? Sometimes a leader enters a role and they find that there's somebody who just appears to absolutely take an instant disliking to them. It's incredibly helpful to know if they applied for your job. If they did apply for your role, it is a really very difficult movement for them to go through. So if you stop and consider, someone's been encouraged to go for a promotion. They've projected themselves into that role. They've pictured themselves resident in that role, occupying that role. And so what's happened is they've energetically left their own role in the process. When they get the news that someone else is in that role, they then potentially experience a backwards movement back into a role that they'd energetically departed from. Is it any wonder that they're not going to be looking with very friendly eyes at the incumbent of the role they thought would be theirs, the new hire from outside or the colleague from inside? And so I've had this situation with many new senior leaders in role that they've had a quite a problem and, and they're going, I don't even know how they could have such a problem with me yet. And they're not always told who went for their role, but it's really helpful to entertain the notion that that could be at play. And it's, it's not an easy one quite often, 
the, the best thing for that those people is to leave. It sounds very harsh, doesn't it? It's simply that we don't like regression. We like progression. And so if that person can't be offered a significant challenge, it can just be very painful. Some people do go okay with it. My training told me that they no one really goes okay. And, and I actually, I would challenge that now because I've seen some people weather it quite well. But it, it's not a safe assumption that anybody would weather that backwards movement terribly easily. You could say that leader's role is a little bit burdened before they've started. It's more burdened again if the incumbent before them left badly or if a series of people left badly. And then you can see that certain roles get termed as ejection seat syndrome. Have you heard that before? Ejector seat. Like, um, yeah, like on the rocket where they eject themselves into outer space, but it's a, it's actually a place, it's a role to occupy. And you can see sometimes, and I've seen this with senior leadership roles, that whoever goes there gets quite unwell. And it can even show up in health issues. And um, that's, that's something very important that's been excluded from the story that the person occupying that role might know today. And so your curiosity that you fed into the chat room at the start is supremely helpful. When we look at these dynamics through a systemic lens, here's what we do. We get less identified with who's in the role and all that they bring through their personality. And we get far more curious about what would it be like for anyone to be in that role? in that place, what are the tensions around the role between that and other roles across functions and departments, including the history of the role? And so we start to stop and appreciate how might I go if I was in that spot? Would I go well? Would I thrive? Or would I find myself somehow subjected to this, these tensions that live within and around the role itself. And so we can see now, can't we, that zooming out in this way gives us a very different picture. So I'm just keeping an eye on the time. I feel like I've, I'm, I'd, I'd really like to fast forward you. I hope this has given a bit of background on adopting a systemic lens. We run some public online training, including internationally for practitioners in systemic leadership coaching. So if that's your thing, we'll make sure there's a link that you can ask for more information beyond that today. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom right in on your relationship with conflict. And I want to encourage you to reflect on this through a couple of different lenses. And I'm going to go a little bit, a little bit quicker than planned. So I've, I've drawn out two elements because when you are coaching using a systems lens, spatial awareness is incredibly helpful to surface our blind spots. It's incredibly helpful to shed light on dynamics that might be at play that we're not even aware of. And so this is an exercise originally designed by John Whittington that I was lucky enough and my team was lucky enough to do some study with. And we didn't look at conflict, but I'm applying his this particular view to conflict. And so there's me and everything I bring and my story over here on the left. And then on the right, there's conflict. And to capture my relationship with conflict today and where I now stand, what's really helpful to appreciate the personal nature of this is to use an I statement. And so I'd ask each of you, and feel free to share this in the chat, when you consider yourself in relationship with conflict, if you were to look at conflict and capture that relationship in an I statement, based on some of your earlier entries in the chat, I'd, I'd anticipate some of you might say, I'm curious about you. I want to understand you. I want to learn from you. When I run this exercise, even with very senior leaders, they will often say, I'm, I'm frightened by you. 
I have done everything in my power to avoid you. I don't want to look at you. I'd rather run away from you. And so we know as leaders that um, there needs to be a healthy relationship with conflict. And so what I'm advocating for is that as leadership practitioners, as coaches, as mentors, that it's really important to be proactively managing my own relationship with conflict and evolving it. And so I wanted to give you an opportunity. Oh, I was going to do this in breakouts. I'm just checking time, Tim. Um, have we got time? To oh, you've, do got time 10. Right? you've got 10. You've got 10. Okay. All right. So I'm going to show, I'm going to introduce you to a brief exercise and then we're going to put links to, we're going to have four breakout rooms, I'm suspecting. And so I'm going to get you the check to give you the opportunity to look at how you've already evolved your relationship with conflict to date through your adult life. And you might reflect on a time earlier in your career or even earlier in your life when you had a more challenging or less aware relationship with conflict compared to now. In the, I'll share screen again, in the chat, I've just got, can you see that? Is that coming up, Tim? It is? Great. So in the chat, you've got links to these interactive slides. And what you're going to do is, you can you can make yourself bigger, you can make yourself smaller, you can go close to conflict like this, or you can completely turn your back on it. Anything that captures your relationship with conflict and what proximity you would ideally form in that relationship with conflict. And if an I statement comes up to capture that relationship, then wonderful, what you can do, and hopefully you can see this fine, is you can insert a text box like this and you can say whatever you like. Maybe in the past it was I would rather not look at you and now it's I'm curious about you. And so in the chat now are some links. We're going to go to breakouts and just what am I suggesting you do? I'm suggesting you have a play and work with the spatial dimensions to appreciate your relationship with conflict, what it was then and what it is now. And then I'll, I'll wrap up with a super, super brief case study. So in the breakout, in the chat, you can see uh, links do you all know how to bring up the chat from your breakout rooms? Because once you're in there, you'll realise your room number and you'll click on that. Decide who's going to be the facilitator and who's going to be the coach E. We'll have only six minutes. So we might you might get to swap, you might not get to swap. But if you don't get to swap, you're very welcome to keep playing with this beyond this session. Is that clear enough? Can you give me a thumbs up if that's clear? Yep. Great. All right. Enjoy having a play in the breakouts. Welcome back. I, I apologise. Um, you weren't able to share your screen until well into that breakout. Uh, did anyone get to use the interactive tool with any success for reflection? Maybe you can just wave at me. Eileen, you were. Oh, Louis, you were as well. Okay. Um, I'm. Others, I, I heard some wonderful conversations were happening and some beautiful coaching in your breakouts anyway. So I'm not assuming if you didn't access the tool that you didn't get some value from that time together. But I did want to make sure that I give you some options now. So at half past the hour, there is the choice to go into just some general networking about the topic and some conversation. There's also a choice because of that technical glitch to extend this exercise so you get more of a chance to use the spatial tool and capture the dynamics of your relationship with conflict and how you might choose to evolve your relationship with conflict. 
I wanted to share with you the ultimate resource for working with conflict. But before I just roll into that and assume that you want to eat into your networking time, which was planned for the next half hour, can I see if there's appetite for that? And if you would like to continue a little bit further, I'm getting a yes from Matt. Can you? A yes from Eileen. Yes from Louis. Yes, okay. Uh, Ranjit and Cassie, what about you? Yeah, I'd love to, Vanessa. Unfortunately, I, I'm not too so, sure. But in my diary, it sort of took me to an hour and a half of this session, I think. It, oh, it okay. The, I'm so sorry. It, it I had it in my the, diary for two yeah. hours. So please do go. I mean, the last thing I want to do is create conflict <laughs> because I'm expecting you to be here when you're booked to be anywhere else. I really don't like that sensation. So can I can I just give the chance for those of you that want to stay to stay and for those of you that you want to leave to just, um, we can say a brief goodbye and my apologies for some of the technical challenges I should have anticipated there. But Vanessa, um, um, can I ask you, can you just give a 30 second grab on what you felt the dialogue brought out for you today? Uh, what I what I what I like to say is what I learned from all of you on the call, and I learned once again the uh, the rich dynamics that arise in us when we look at conflict, and I also learned some really beautiful uh, lenses that some of you are using to approach conflict, and the learnings that you've already had. 